talking. Good morning. I hope that you're having a good morning. We're closing out our week in Exodus chapter 5. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 5. We are looking at the nation of Israel. They're enslaved. They've been enslaved for 400 plus years. They've gone from being uh, favored by the Egyptian people because of what God did through Joseph to now being enslaved. And God is working his plan. How do you get people to leave the comfort that they were in in Egypt? Simple. Place them under taskmasters, put them in hard labor, and then they're crying out to God, and God hears their cry. God is looking for a partner to come alongside of him to uh, carry out his plan. Remember, God's plan would be carried out with or without Moses, but Moses gets to be part of it. And again, we're going to emphasize the competing stories. We have the story of Yahweh and the story of the Egyptian gods. We're going to just emphasize today Amun-Ra, the sun god. And, and Pharaoh is his partner and Moses is Yahweh's partner and there is a showdown. Uh, next week we will get into the plagues and what that looks like in the showdown. But let there be no mistake, there really is no showdown. God rules. Uh, God is the only God. Demons come against God's plan, but they can't change it. As a matter of fact, even in all of their rebellion, all they do is carry out God's plan. That does not absolve them of the culpability of being in rebellion against God, nor will it with you or I. Remember, God's will is going to happen. It's not going to happen Fast or slow, it's going to happen right as God wants it to happen. You and I, regardless of what we do, will not change God's will. However, whether I continue like I was born in rebellion against God, or whether I surrender control of my life and submit to God, will really change the way I experience God's will in this life and also in all of eternity. So... We have Moses giving all the excuses to God, God answering them, God giving him three signs, the sign of the staff turning into a serpent, the sign of the leprosy, and the sign of water turning from the Nile turning into blood. Just in a, a like a small cup full, we'll see later that will be a, a larger sign. We see God getting upset with Moses because he will not believe what God has said. He keeps looking at his own insufficiencies. So he gives uh, Moses, Aaron, his brother, to be the mouthpiece for him. Uh, we get to the end of the chapter and we see that God gets angry with him. First, for not believing him about his own sufficiency, about God's sufficiency, but also in that Moses was not being obedient to God with his children about the right of circumcision. And so we've gone all the way through that. At the end, we see Moses and Aaron coming before the elders of Israel. And we see them believing the signs and what a positive thing we see at the end of chapter 4. And they're all bowed low and worshiping God. Uh, however, in chapter 5, we're going to see that that changes a little bit. Things are going to get more difficult uh, for them. And their faith we're going, is going to be revealed as being very fragile and at times non-existent. So we're going to, in chapter 5, we're going to see God clearly. But we're going to see the frailty of man's faith in God, clearly, but God's patience through all of it. I hope that it will reveal to you how God has worked in your life, how he has been loving and kind. He's been patient, uh, but all for the purpose of wanting you and I to repent. First, repenting of who we are at justification at when we're born again 
but then ongoing every day of our life, repenting of actions and attitudes that we do that don't line up with being a child of God. So, if you haven't already read chapter 5, <laughs> read it, and then we'll pray and, and dive in. Father, we love you. It has been another joyful week of trusting in you. Another week of seeing uh, your hand at work, and, and this week has been a great one for that. Father, we have seen in little glimpses your hand, and we are so thankful, Father, that we get to do this with you. And so, uh, Father, may we not be found complaining. May we not be found criticizing. But, Father, guide and direct us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And afterwards Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, and it really doesn't give all the logistics of how did Aaron and Moses get an audience with Pharaoh. I think it's probably pretty clear. Remember, Moses and this present Pharaoh more than likely grew up together. So when the Pharaoh hears, hey, Moses would like to see you, I'm sure that that was an open door. And they said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Yahweh Elohim of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. We'll talk more to that in a second. So they just come on the scene and say, hey, God, you know, you know God, and Pharaoh clearly doesn't. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, just laying out clearly what God wants. God the God of the universe that is working through this nation wants you to let them go. Now, the way it is put forth is that God wants them to go three days out into the wilderness and three days back and have one day of worship and celebration. So we're talking about a week. So what he's saying is God wants you to give all the slaves a week's vacation. A week off of work so that they can go worship God. Now remember, we've got the competing stories going on. Pharaoh believes he's God, a lesser God under the sun god, Amun-Ra. Uh, so Amun-Ra didn't tell him anything about letting these people go, so he, you know, he's going to take very little of what they say. He, look what he says. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? So what he's saying is, Who is Yahweh? I know who Amun-Ra is, but who is Yahweh? I don't know him. And what's interesting is just two chapters ago, Moses really didn't know Yahweh. He had heard about him from his parents. His grandparents clearly knew Yahweh, but Moses had his first encounter with Yahweh in chapter 3. But so it's, it's no great surprise that Pharaoh didn't know anything about Yahweh. He says, uh, besides, guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not letting them go, period. So first he says, who is the Lord? That's the first question. The second question is going to be a why question, but we'll get to that. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews, that's Elohim, Almighty God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Now the us there is pretty problematic. Um, the us here, Moses is saying, hey, we've got to do what God says. If we don't, he's going to punish us. Uh, but also, he, he's going to do the same to you if you don't allow us to. Now, again, let's emphasize this. The physical manifestation of the sun god, Amun-Ra, was a ram's head on a lion's body. And 
these statues were, you know, in the tens of thousands all over um, the Egyptian empire. And so the thought of these slaves, these shepherds who they didn't like anyway, but they're slaves, and to think that their slaves are going to go out there in the wilderness and start killing a bunch of sheep that represent the manifestation of the God that Pharaoh represents, you can see how these two stories are colliding. And you can start to see why Pharaoh, at this moment, has got no use uh, for what the Israelites are asking. There's no way he's going to allow them, a million plus people, to go out there. How many rams are they going to murder out there? Representations of what Pharaoh sees as the God Amon Ra. Uh, but the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why? Why do you draw the people away from their work? So first he says, I don't who's the Lord? Second, why are you at why are you stopping the people from working? Now, this is the big problem with slavery, right? It's it's using people uh, to get more material work done when God's plan is to use material things to love people. So he doesn't care anything about these people. They're, they're a means to an end. Uh, he said, get back to your labors, which is interesting because it almost appears as if, you know, Moses hasn't been a slave for the last 40 years. And, but Aaron has been. So he's telling Aaron, you better get back to what you're supposed to be doing. I don't, in my mind, I don't know how Aaron broke free from the, the slavery, except for God was guiding it. But now Moses, he, get back. Now remember, Pharaoh and Moses grew up together. They, they know each other more than likely. Um, he says, again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors? Do you know what kind of logistics it would take to take a million folks out there for a week's vacay to worship God? I don't think that's going to happen. It seemed kind of suspect to Pharaoh. Remember, God is giving Pharaoh what he wants, hardening his heart. So the, day, the, so the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen saying, you are no longer to give the people straw to make the brick as previously. Now, they would take the mud of bricks, and these were not kiln-dried bricks. They would take straw, and kind of on the same uh, line of the way we use rebar and metal fencing in concrete, it reinforces it. They would take straw and put that in the middle of the mud, put it in a mold, pack it, and then they would take it out and lay it in the sun until it dried. And the sun would reinforce the mud from cracking too easily. And when they were laid on top of each other together, it was a very strong, strong way of building construction. Many of these structures are still here today, some 4,000 plus years you know, later. Um, so he says, hey, tell them they want a week off to go worship God. I'm going to make their life worse. No longer am I going to provide the straw. They're going to have to go out and find it. Now, straw wasn't something that grew naturally. They had to, to get it. And what we're going to find is that was impossible. There was no way that they could do it. And it says, uh, let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of the bricks which they were making previously, you shall impose on them. You shall not reduce any of it. Why? Because they're lazy. Therefore, they cry out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. He believes they're making this up. See, the only God that Pharaoh believes in at this point is himself. But let's be frank. That's really where every one of us are born. Every one of us are born really believing only in ourselves. We don't even think our parents know the right thing. That's why we rebel against them. He says, let the labor be heavier on the men and let them work at it so that they will pay no attention to the false words. 
He knew they couldn't make the same quota of bricks while they're trying to go out and find the straw. He says, I just want to make this so hard on them that I don't hear this vacation stuff or this worship or this sacrifice stuff. Again, let's nip this in the bud. And so, verse 10, So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get the straw for yourselves whenever you can find it. But none of your labors will be reduced. So, for instance, they're not going to keep the same quota. But let's say they were working 10-hour days before. Now they're going to be working 18-hour days, and they're still not going to be getting it done. So it's, it's going to cause a lot of angst. And initially, their belief back in the end of chapter 4 that God was concerned about their affliction, the pressure that they were under. And Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and suddenly the pressure that they were under before gets ramped up double. And they're like, what the what? So the people scattered through all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. Now remember, it's desert, so it's not like there's grass everywhere that they can let dry and use that. The taskmasters pressed them, saying, Complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Can't do it. It's not possible. Moreover, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmaster had set over them, were beaten. And were asked, why have you not completed your requirement uh, either yesterday or today in making the bricks? They couldn't do it. And the Egyptians know that it can't be done and the Israelites know it can't be done. This is all a ploy to make sure to teach those slaves that they don't ask certain things. Then the foremen of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh. Now, I think this is an interesting thing here. Remember, the, the people of Israel don't know Yahweh. Pharaoh doesn't know Yahweh. The Egyptians don't know Yahweh. Okay. Now, clearly, some of the uh, Israelites knew Yahweh, but for the majority of them, we're going to see that they don't. They were crying out in general when God heard them. When God intervened. Okay. But here there still seems to be a double-mindedness. Do we trust God like we did at the end of chapter 4? But now things have gotten worse, so now do we go trust Pharaoh? They're, they're still torn between the two stories. But what we read already in Joshua chapter 24 yesterday is that they were, they're going to be torn throughout the history of Israel. Um, if you go and read James chapter 1, where it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That the opposite of faith is doubt. And so when we come to the Lord, we have to come in faith without doubting. They, they came to the Lord, they said, we believe. But as soon as things got more pressurized, their workload got more difficult, now they're waffling. Uh, in the future, we're going to see this come from them. When things get a little more difficult, uh, they're going to complain and they're going to criticize God's people, God's leaders. Uh, really, they're going to be complaining and criticizing God. Um, God wants them out of this land of Egypt, even though for years and years and years, hundreds of years, it's been a comfortable middle class lifestyle for them. But now they're slaves. Maybe they've been slaves for 130 years. So now they're wanting to come out. But go out where? It's going to get worse for them before it's going to get better. And we're going to see them really get tested. A whole generation is going to have to die. This generation that he's speaking to right now is going to have to die before God can bring them into the promised land. Why? Because they refuse to believe what God says when things get difficult in their lives. We've got to ask ourselves this same question. Do I believe in God because God makes my life right now presently easier? Or do I want to know God regardless of the circumstances, whether good or bad? 
They cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants. Yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are being beaten. But it is the fault of your own people. You're the one withholding straw. Now, Pharaoh knows all of this. Verse 17, but he said, You're lazy, very lazy. Uh, therefore, you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, none of that's true. Uh, but again, who's the Lord? Pharaoh doesn't know who he is, but he will get a clear picture fairly soon. Second, doesn't want him to stop working because they're, they're making life easier for Pharaoh. Free labor. Uh, so go now and work, for you will be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quotas of bricks. Okay, so there's it's hopelessness that's put in front of the Israelites. But that's just really where God works. God loves to get us to the place of hopelessness. At the end of ourselves, where we cannot draw on our own strength any longer, that's when God steps in. The foreman of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble. Man, this is prime time for God. When you start seeing you are in big trouble, you should cry out to him. Because they were told you must not reduce your daily amounts of brick. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Uh, a little dramatic here. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Okay, they're they're seeing in the future uh, how bad this could be. They're they're uh, exaggerating for the point of emphasis. Uh, verses twenty two and twenty three really give the third question in this chapter. First question, Pharaoh asks, "Who's Yahweh?" I don't know who he is. Second question, "Why are you stopping the, the slaves from working?" The third question is going to come from Moses. Why, God, did you ask me to do something and make an idiot out of me? Boy. Remember, God's timetable is not my timetable. Look what it says. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Yahweh, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Now, Let's stop for a second. Go back to chapter 3, verse 19, where it says, The Lord God... No, it says, uh, verse 19, But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. All... And, and all of chapter 6 that we're going to go through next time, we're together, we'll, we'll see the patience of God in reminding, reminding Moses, reminding Aaron, this is what I said, and this is what I'm going to do. This is what I said, and this is what I'm going to do. This is so important for you and me. First, we've got to know what God says. How many times in Scripture do we see the word, remember, remember, remember? Because when things start getting difficult for me, when the affliction, the pressure of life seems to get ramped up, we hear this voice in the back of our head saying, God is not good. And that's not the voice of God. It's the hiss of the snake. Verse 23. Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. None, I, just take this second to think about this bold prayer that Moses says to God. And I, and I want you to know something. It's very important for you and I to come before God in prayer and lay out how we feel. None of this is reality. God's going to deliver him and his time. It's just this is how Moses feels at the moment, and he can speak that to God, and God can handle it. 
God already knows his heart. It's good for us to speak it because then we're going to look like idiots later on when God does work it all out. And then we will grow in humility. So I ask you, when you're at the end of yourself and you don't know what to do and there doesn't seem to be any way out, come before God. Seek him. First, tell him exactly how you feel. I think it's probably good to say, God, I know this isn't reality, but this is the way I feel presently with what's going on. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, the verse 1, it says, hey, there's these four types of prayer. He talks about entreaties. He says prayer, uh, petition, and then thanks. Come before God this way. The prayer word there is just communing with God. Do you ever just come before God, not with a problem, not with needing something, but just wanting to worship and abide with him? I pray that as we're going through the scripture, this is what we're doing. We're abiding in the vine. We're getting to know him. Prayer, communication, communion with God. But entreaties are personal. Personal meaning, I know God wants me to do this. In Moses' situation, it would be, I know, God, that you want me to go down there and bring your people out of Egypt. But I don't have what I need to be able to accomplish what you want me to accomplish. So, God, I'm asking you. Man, that's what chapters 3 and 4 are all about. If you know what God wants you to do, and overall we know that God wants us to make disciples of Jesus Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father teaching them to do everything that the Word says. But I, I don't have what I need, God. I need you to provide what I need to carry out your will. That's a great prayer. The, the word petition there is for others. Entreaties is for myself. Petitions are for others, but the same basic meaning. I know somebody else, Father, that they know what you want them to do, but they don't have what they need to carry it out. So I'm interceding for them, that you would provide what they need to carry out what you want them to do. And then lastly, just thanking God for the whole process. When you get the glimpse or the glimpses of what God is doing, what a humbling moment, what joy there is to look back and see all the pain, even maybe pain times where I was complaining, even when I was criticizing that I can see God's faithful hand of love and mercy all the way. May God honor the reading of his word today. Father, we love you. Help us to love you more. Today, Father, through the interruptions and the waiting, that we would be busy serving you in the process. Father, help us in Jesus' name. Amen.